<laughs> Praise the Lord. Man, you know, when my back goes out, it's tough. It hurts. It has a, a weakness in my back that if I sleep, then what should be straight and narrow, or maybe curved a little bit, suddenly because my back gets all out of sync, it moves in some of the little, you know, um, vertebrae that should be like, you know, kind of like these knuckles kind of stuck together so that they'll, see how they wobble back and forth, move kind of around? That's the way your back does. It fits together. It's a joint that jointly fit together works. Kind of like in the body of Christ. That's the way people are supposed to be jointly fit together. They're supposed to, you know, have their own little space and they have their own little, you know, like fluid to hold and make sure that that all works together. But everyone has a place and a purpose, a design, a function in the body of Christ. It's not always kind of like what sometimes people see, you know, like a lot of people see, oh, well, I'm a pastor in the body of Christ or I'm a deacon in the body of Christ. That's not really what Jesus meant. Although those things are good preparation for what God has inspiration in your life to learn from, there's more to the body of Christ than church. Church is kind of like the practice session. It's kind of like schooling. It's like a classroom where you learn how to be a part of the body of Christ. You become eventually from the body of Christ, well first you go to church and you become a member of the body of Christ. It's kind of like a amorphosis. You change from a member of the world to a member of God's kingdom. Then as you're in the kingdom, you become part of the body of Christ, this huge conglomerate of all the other Christians in the world. Many are called, but few are chosen, so God, God begins to use you and put you into his placement where he wants you to be. And as he does, he begins to change you to make you into the image of his son so that you can work cooperatively together with those other members of the body of Christ. Now, God said, I want you to do that so that you would be become part of my bride that I'm getting ready for my son. I want you to be a part of this wonderful place that I'm going to take all the members of the body of Christ that I've chosen to become the bride that I want for my son. And so, as you go through this process of church to body of Christ to bride, you'll see that you become aware of more people that God has somehow developed into a loving, beautiful bride, chaste and virgin for Jesus. And you become part of that. And so you go through this kind of three-step process, you know, you kind of like, hey, you go to church, you know, and you kind of, you know, do your thing, you know. It's nice, you know, it looks like that's what God intended for you. Then you suddenly step into a bigger sphere of influence when you step outside of the church and you become like a missionary and you see the rest of the story that God has for your glory and for his. That, wow, he can use you to inspire others to get beyond the parameters or the, the, the box, so to speak, of the church, your church, your local little body of fellowship where you practice to become like a, a deacon or an elder or a pastor. You grow bigger than that, you know, and you suddenly see the bigger picture and you go, ooh, there's a big giant world out there and, you know, going out and getting involved in it is something cool and wonderful. I begin to see that there's more to life than just living for myself and my little community and you become a part of that body. Then as you see that bigger picture, you suddenly recognize that in all the different members of the body of Christ, you begin to see some that are fit for love and joy and peace, and they inspire you, you know, to pursue on to know God in a more intimate, personal way. You become greater in your appreciation of those members of the body of Christ that are around you, and you begin to care for them. And as you do, you'll find yourself in a place that Moses was, that Abraham was, that you and I find ourselves every day. And that's obedience. Are we willing to lay down our lives for the sake of others? Are we willing to give up our salvation for someone else's? 
You see, that's what Jesus did. Jesus literally gave up his Godhead, so to speak, to become flesh and blood, to become human for us. He was willing to sacrifice in order to be the perfect son that he became one with the Father, one with us. And we come to that place eventually, not, not immediately, but eventually we come to that place where we say, oh, I'm willing to lay down my life for the sake of others. Oh, sure, we say that in church. And as long as we agree with the people, we lay down our life. But as soon as we don't agree with them, we don't lay down our life. You see, Moses, when he went up on the mountaintop, was warned by God, people have sinned a great sin. You better go down because I'm going to kill them. I'm going to start over again with you, you know, and I'm going to make sure that, you know, we get it right because, you know, they're, they're, they just ticked me off. He didn't really say ticked off, but he was, he was pretty much giving Moses a chance to reveal the kind of person Moses was. And so Moses said, but God, you brought him this far. You don't want to do that. Don't, don't wipe him out. Take me instead. Wipe me out, but save your children that you brought out of Egypt, out of bondage, that you said you would deliver and so for the sake of love, Moses was willing to give up his salvation. I always wonder if we're willing to do that. By token idealism, of course, we say we're willing to die. But really, are we willing to die for those that hate us? Are we willing to die for those that despitefully use us? Are we willing to die for those that chastise us, that treat us like we're the worst thing in the world, you know, our enemies? Jesus said, you know, it's easy for a man to lay down his life, you know, for those that agree with him. But how many would lay down their life for those that don't? How many would die for their enemies rather than kill their enemies or lock them up? That's the question we have to ask ourselves when we move into the greater sphere of influence, when we step out of not just being a part of the local church or the body of Christ, but when we become the bride when we become that chaste virgin for God, when we fall in love with Jesus so much, are we willing to lay down our bad ideas, our preconceived notions of what God wants for us? Are we willing to change our mind and have it brought into the, the understanding that God has for us? Are we willing to not think of our own ways, but do it His way? That's the challenge that we face because, you know, someone told me a long time ago that I learned Think of God this way, they said to me, you know, in my early days. Think of everything that you know and then go the opposite way. I went, you know, for me logically, because I'm a logical person, I could do that. And so it's kind of like, you know, yeah, okay, fine. And as I went through stages of understanding God, you know, I'd realize that, you know, the world wants to be the world wants you to be more, to grow more, to be bigger. God uses lesser and smaller and more intimate. The world grows larger. God wants you to be smaller. He that would be the greatest, let him be the servant of all. There's so much about the opposite of what we think that God does that really it works a lot of times in your understanding of who God is and how he does things. When you think of less is more, you often will find an accuracy of what God wants to do with us. So when I am reduced to pain and suffering, some, like today, you know, sometimes when the, the back pain you know, gets to be so out of sync, you know, it's kind of like, it's almost like my knuckles come apart, you know, and my back is a little twisted and the muscles that normally like they wrap like this your muscles in case you didn't know this this is your your knuckles are kind of like your your vertebrae in your back then you have these muscles that wrap around your vertebrae to hold them in place they're kind of like all pulled different ways your muscles they wrap around and they go up and down and they, they get into all different you know configurations on your back so that way it holds everything in place but when you get less exercise or you sleep wrong your muscles will become kind of like instead of flat and holding everything in, they get kind of bent. They kind of pull and then they twist and then they get stuck that way. 
So they have to be massaged and assuaged. They kind of have to be manipulated. You have to kind of rub them and put heat on them and kind of make sure that, you know, things begin to loosen up because there's so many different knots that you have to kind of work it a little bit, you know, to get the knots back out of place so that you can put the knuckles back into place so that your back could go back into place so that everything could be working together. That's a lot like what it is in church, you know. Sometimes people get knotted. People get kind of like, you know, twisted. They get kind of like out of sorts. And they're more like a muscle that's really not where it should be, not doing what it's supposed to do, and it's kind of like functioning, but not the right way. A lot of people are like that in life. They're okay, technically. I mean, you know, they're, they're a muscle, you know what I mean? They're supposed to hold in place, you know, the, the, the structure, you know, the, the idea that, you know, they're a knuckle, you know, that they're a vertebrae and the backbone of God. But the muscle somehow has gotten flabby or through lack of exercise, it suddenly knots up when it's used once or it gets kind of like twisted in a different direction and it doesn't really know what to do. The muscle itself is all stuck, you know, it's kind of like knotted. And you have to work it, you have to use heat, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, assuage it, you know, you have to use heat and cold and, you know, begin to rub it down to cause it to be loosened up, to get less so pulled tight. And people are like that. They get knotted up because they're tight, stuck on something. and. When you look at people in general as that way, that they're not wrong per se, but they're not right according to scripture because of the way that they're doing what they're doing, you begin to understand God's rationale, God's way of looking at you and I. Not so much as you're wrong and I'm right, or we're wrong and we're both right, but more so that we need to be put into place where we were meant to be. We need to be sometimes treated with a certain amount of you know, medicinal application to put us back into place so that we can hold things together the way God intended us to. Because you see, we don't just hold each other accountable. We hold the very fabric of love for one another as God intended us to be. God wants us to grow in the body of Christ. God wants us to develop as his workmanship created for good works, that we would do those things that God intended us to do, because after all, that is what God has called us to be. Workmen, rightly dividing the word of truth, to be able to come together, to be examples of love to be so anointed and appointed that God could use us in the way that he chooses for us to go because that is the way that he wants us to be. He wants us to become more like him. He wants us to develop into the fullness of the body of Christ. He wants us to step out of our own little world, our own little church, our own little box that we've created for ourselves and become into the body of Christ universal, knowing that there are those who likewise fit properly into their place. And then we become the bride of Christ as we see that. We grow up into the stature of what God wants us to be. He gives us the robe of righteousness and he causes us to be chaste virgins before him. So that when Jesus comes, he finds a bride preparing herself and adorned with all the love, the joy, the peace, the meekness, the kindness, and gentleness to not just those that we agree with, but the entire world. So when God tells us to love the world, it's not that we love it the way it is. We love what God is doing with it. We love the way a person is changing each other. We love the way that we're rubbing off on each other. We love to the point of we're developing the graces that God intended for us to become put back into place when we get twisted or we get knotted or we get our back out of joint or we get, dare I say, our nose out of joint. Sometimes it causes pain. Sometimes it will hurt. Sometimes it will frustrate. Sometimes it will aggravate. But God's not so interested in that immediate cause and effect that you might be feeling. You know, you get mad or you get upset or you get whatever. God cares about the long term. What are you going to do about it? 
In other words, if you find yourself constantly in pain, then you need to recognize why and what is causing that pain and work it so that you begin to become put back into place where God would have you to rest in His grace. You see, that's what I always found. Whenever you're out of sort, you're not in the place God wants you to be. But when you rest in His grace, you find the place that God wants you to be. Because if you can rest in comfort and reassurance that God is in control, if you can know without a shadow of a doubt that God has your best in store for you, then you can go forward in your day confident that God will lead you in the way that He wants you to go. But you still have to find that place of grace, not just for others, but sometimes you need to extend grace to yourself. Because if you do have, like I do today, your back thrown out from rest or from whatever reason, then you have to give yourself grace to allow for that time and place where God doesn't want you to maybe do as much as you want to do, but He wants you to rest in His place where He's caused you to go today. That He might be wanting you to take the time to rest in His love, to be still and know that He is God, to recognize that He's always God, everything, whether you understand it or not, in control. Because after all, He's God and you're not. So the joy of the Lord that we can have day by day is knowing that God is in His place and we are in ours.